Now on to the third legion, the Emperor's children, sometimes referred to after their fall to chaos as the Lords of Proflagracy. They are a notorious traitor legion of chaos space marines who are entirely devoted to the service of the chaos god Slanesh, the Prince of Pleasure. Originally, however, they were the proud and noble third legion of the Imperium of Man. The transformation from esteemed warriors to renegades obsessed with excess is often viewed as one of the most tragic falls in the Imperium's history. Uniquely, the Emperor's children bore the Emperor's own name and icon as their own, the Palatine Aquila, a rare honor bestowed by his hand in order to symbolize the Legion's martial perfection and their meeting of his expectations. Amongst the ancient Space Marine Legions, none were seen as more celebrated or had less of a reason to betray the Master of Mankind kind than the Emperor's children. As they epitomized the Emperor's vision for the Legion's Astartes, noble in action and appearance, all the while excelling in all endeavors, strong, civilized, purposeful, and unwaveringly loyal. Despite their exalted status, the Emperor's children would descend into treachery, becoming one of, if not the singular, most vile and depraved creatures to serve chaos in the 40th millennium. Their pride and hedonistic desires now enslaved them, leading them to betray the Emperor and humanity which they once served with such great distinction. Today, the Emperor's children are merely a shattered legion, much like their counterparts, the World Eaters. Their unity was destroyed by their allegiance to chaos, and now they exist as scattered and autonomous warbands of heretic Astartes in the Eye of Terror. These warbands are dedicated to their own pursuits of corrupt and hedonistic pleasures. Chaos Space Marines of the Emperor's children have become rather infamous for their grotesque mutations and surgical alterations bestowed upon them as gifts by Slanesh or any of the Emperor's children's apothecaries. These alterations are designed to enhance their perfection and allow them to feel more, sense more, experience more than ever before. This is a blessing in the eyes of their twisted patron, further entrenching them in the service of their deviant ways. The transformation of the Emperor's children from paragons of nigh unquestionable virtue to agents of chaos is a grim reminder of the corrupting power of pride. The Emperor's children now exist solely to push every boundary and every experience along with every possible sensation to its utmost. These warriors have been entirely enthralled by Slanesh, the Dark Prince and the youngest of the Chaos Gods. However, there was a time when the Legion was properly led by the Primarch Fulgrim in order for all of them to seek out perfection in all that they did which led them to be regarded as amongst the most dedicated followers of the Emperor, some even seeing them as more loyal and fervent to the cause than the Custodes. Fulgrim, the Emperor's children's Primarch, gained this need for perfection as he grew up on the bleak and dying world of Chemos. This human mining colony had long since fallen into decay and decline as Old Knight had claimed the nigh-endless domains of mankind. Isolated from the surrounding systems, Chemos industry had fallen silent. Its mines replaced by reclamation plants and vapor extraction facilities that barely sustained the dwindling population. Within 50 standard years of his arrival on Chemos, Fulgrim had risen up to leadership, driven by a vision to rediscover and rebuild the wonders of long lost ages. Yet it was only when the Emperor came to Chemos that Fulgrim could fully realize his dreams. By then, Fulgrim's ambition had extended far beyond his homeworld, as he desired to elevate all of humanity to glory yet unseen. When Fulgrim was introduced to the Space Marine Legion that shared his genetic inheritance, his sons, he did not find a resplendent host as many of his brothers did, but a mere 200 battle brothers. It seems that a catastrophic accident had befallen the nascent Third Legion early into their development of its gene seed, significantly hindering its growth and numbers. As a result, Fulgrim's transhuman 
Ronin warriors had to be, in essence, integrated into another legion's ranks until their numbers were sufficiently restored to fight independently under Fulgrim's leadership. And his warriors were assigned, unfortunately in the long run, to the Luna Wolves, the legion of Horus Lupical. Under Horus's guidance, Fulgrim would master the arts of warfare to an unprecedented degree. This would set the stage for the Emperor's children's early successes and their eventual tragic downfall. The rise and fall of the Emperor's children is a tale woven in ambition and in the pursuit of the ever unattainable perfection. They were transformed from paragons of virtue to the most vile and malevolent of all chaos corrupted due to their unchecked pride and hedonism. From the earliest days of its service during the Great Crusade, long before their Primarch was discovered, the nascent Third Legion was renowned for its relentless pursuit of perfection in all endeavors. Its dedication, coupled with their extraordinary defense of the Emperor during the Proximan Rebellion, earned them the unique honor of bearing the Emperor's Aquila on their chest. This distinguished mark symbolized their status and their unwavering and unshakable commitment to the Emperor, which led to the early designation of their legion as the Emperor's Children, a title they retained even after the catastrophic events of the Horus Heresy. Some argue that Fulgrim's insatiable desire for perfection ultimately drove him and his legion into the service of Slanesh. However, the exact details of Fulgrim's fall may still yet be shrouded in mystery, but it is evident that Horus must have actively appealed to Fulgrim's refined sensibilities in order to exacerbate his already disturbing quest for unattainable heights of sensation and perfection. However, his limits would come much later than those of any other mortal, as Fulgrim was gifted with the post-human physique of a Primarch, one which allowed no endeavor to seem beyond reach, despite everyone having their own limits. Every strategy and tactic of war, along with the pursuit of various artistic endeavors, from poetry to sculpture, would become almost natural once Fulgrim set his mind to it. As Fulgrim's soul became increasingly tainted by the influences of Slanesh even before his attaining of the Lair Blade, his passions would grow darker and darker and his desires more extreme. And eventually, acting on Horus's behest, Fulgrim would attempt to persuade his brother Primarch, Ferris Manus, and his best friend into believing that factions within the nascent Imperium had begun to collaborate and conspire against Fulgrim, Ferris, and their kin. This would eventually lead to a bitter confrontation of the once closest of brothers. And although Fulgrim survived the encounter, Fulgrim's reward was not but damnation, setting him firmly on the path that would lead the Emperor's children to side permanently with the traitorous forces of chaos, beginning at Isvan V and ultimately leading to the Siege of Terra. Even though the Emperor's children were present during the Siege of Terra, they would not partake in the direct assault on the formidable fortifications established by the Praetorian of Terra, Rogal Dorn, Primarch of the Imperial Fists Legion. Unlike the World Eaters and the other traitor legions who relentlessly attacked the Imperial Palace, the Emperor's children decided to indulge in their own way, wreaking havoc on the surrounding cities and outlying regions of the throne world. In a veritable conflagration of unrestrained cruelty and depravity, they would slaughter untold thousands, millions even, of the Emperor's subjects, just for the thrill of it. There are still whispers that the Emperor's children used the unprecedented violence of the Siege of Terra to harvest vital fluids from their countless victims, creating an abominable distillation which would function as a stimulant granting them access to previously unheard heights of sensation. Ultimately, the Siege of Terra ended when the Emperor slew the arch-traitor Horus, forcing whatever remnants of the Emperor's children remained to retreat from Terra along with the other traitor legions. In their flight, the Emperor's children would leave behind a trail of desecrated worlds and violated populations, eventually joining the ranks of those traitor legions who sought refuge within the Eye of Terror. Here, 
they would initiate a new and devastating series of conflicts against their former allies amongst the Chaos forces in their relentless search for more mortal and demigod slaves to serve their hedonistic desires. The post-Siege of Terra history of the Emperor's children seems to be largely obscured from many an Imperial scholar, which has left one of the greatest mysteries concerning the fate of Fulgrim, who appears to have vanished after having ascended into a demon prince of chaos, though there are whispers that after his apotheosis he eventually started to return to the mortal plane. There are also claims that Fulcrum has potentially retreated and hidden within a demon world of his own, where he continues to rule, overseeing the based extremes of sensation and experiences far beyond mortal comprehension. For those who revere Slanesh, this mythical place is considered the holiest of holies, with many dedicating their entire lives in obsessive quests to find a place that may or may not exist. Now, on to the origins of the Third Legion. The Third Legion was created alongside its brother Space Marine Legions during the later phases of the Unification Wars. Many of its finest warriors were drawn exclusively from the courts and the blood of the princes and royalty from the continent of Europa. The nobles of Europa would go on to select their best youth, their heirs, offering them up to the Emperor of Mankind as both a tribute and penance for the previous defiance, following their systematic defeat by the Imperial Thunder Regiments. Amongst these offerings were the firstborn sons of each noble family, a fact which some Imperial scholars believed gave them their legion's enduring name, where the Aquila would be gained later. Some European noble families contributed grudgingly, viewing these young men as little more than hostages, while others would seek to cooperate with the zeal of true converts to the Imperial cause. However, the Third Legion's early developments were marked by these dualities of both honor and defiance, tribute and penance, zeal and reluctance. House Locus of Komarag, for example, reportedly sent all of its sons in order to have them transformed into Astartes upon their capitulation to imperial rule, and would continue to give their firstborn of each generation thereafter to the Third Legion willingly in subsequent solar decades. Other Terran dynasties would follow the example set by many of the nobles in Europa, filling the ranks of the Third Legion with the best-bred youth on Terra. This would create a martial brotherhood whose ancestry stretched back to the lost ages of human history. In their early conflicts, the Third Legion supported some of the most noble actions of the nascent Imperium, in particular functioning alongside the Imperial Army proper, often directly leading its troops into battle. This approach differed notably from many of the first founding Space Marine Legions, which were typically deployed as unified commands en masse, serving as shock troops who were only supported by heavy war machinery. The integration of these noble youths into the Third Legion not only strengthened its ranks, but it infused the legions with a unique blend of aristocratic honor and martial prowess, differentiating their combat techniques from those of the other legions Astartes, creating an identity solely unique and unparalleled within their brother transhumans. Not even the noble custodies could boast of such genetic lineage, as the Third Legion possessed a profound understanding of the strengths and myriad weaknesses of the diverse armies serving the Emperor as they drew from Terra's rich military traditions in order to command with authority and purpose. During the Unification Wars, notable campaigns such as the Antarctic Clearance served as a testament to the Third Legion's strategic power, using limited, using limited resources to accomplish something that would have left many other legions struggling for much longer. And while history credits Army group Antillus with the victory, a closer examination will reveal that it was actually the Third Legion that crafted the tactics and directed the campaign to its successful conclusion. Similarly, the bronze host conquest of Naridan and the fifth rising of Jove Sat 
II were largely orchestrated by the Third Legion. Despite this honor roll being extensive during the Unification War, they did not bear the Third Legion's names proper. These examples would underscore the Legion's exceptional ability to not only execute military operations to far surpass the Emperor's expectations in warfare. It seems their coordination with what some Astartes viewed as lesser troops came naturally to the former aristocrats of the Third Legion, as they possessed a profound understanding of the human mind and the duties of leadership. Even though it would become a point of derision by other legions, they would continue on with this tradition for long into the Great Crusade. It would only be after the Proximian betrayal during the Great Crusade that the Third Legion would earn a singular distinction that would last throughout the entirety of the Great Crusade, the right to bear the Palatine Aquila. This was the God Emperor's personal standard, and they got to use it within their heraldry. This great honor was one that was not shared between the legions. That was until the tumultuous events that were the Horus Heresy, which prompted this symbol's adoption by all loyalist legions. This honor was not one that was bestowed lightly, but one which was earned through great valor and sacrifice. During the imperial compliance ceremonies of Proxima, one of the Third Legion's most noble of cohorts was serving as the Emperor's honor guard, and they stood fast against an insurrectionist surprise attack. They, alongside the Legio Custodes, fought fiercely against significantly greater numbers, and held their ground in order to protect the wounded Emperor from an ambush involving the devastating and deadly Vortex weapons. Their heroic sacrifice allowed the Emperor crucial moments to recover so he could lead a mighty counteroffensive. In recognition for this unwavering loyalty and bravery, the Emperor himself would proclaim that they had the right to the Palatine Aquila as the standard of the Third Legion Astartes. This revered testament to their deeds became a symbol of unique honor amongst those loyal to the Imperium. It also granted them the solemn duty to enact a complete and total exterminatus upon Proxima. In ensuring justice for their fallen and sealing their legacy as the first legion to be granted such a sacred emblem directly by the emperor. Not even the noble first legion would have such an honor. The Palatine Aquila, with its profound significance representing both the Imperium and humanity, would become the most enduring of emblems for the third legion, one which some could argue would push them further and further in their attempts to reach perfection, potentially being part of what led them to their fall to Slanesh. From then on, in times of peril and utmost danger, the Emperor would entrust members of his newly renamed Emperor's children with pivotal roles as his personal equilifers and equerries, roles that would otherwise be served by the Custodes. These Astartes bore the revered Palatine standard as a symbol that marked their equality with the Emperor's personal bodyguard. In battle, they would command newly acquired armies and lead them through the adaptation process, ensuring compliance with the Emperor's will, and guaranteeing that they would meet his rigorous standards. The mere presence of these warriors bearing the Emperor's symbol was often enough to maintain the obedience of wavering allies, in particular in recently pacified human worlds. This privileged role elevated the Emperor's children in distinction as the Emperor's chosen elite. This led to a reputation for faithfully executing orders without deviation even at the cost of their own lives. This was unparalleled amongst the legions of the begrudging Imperium. However, one catastrophic event that would leave an indelible mark upon the early decades of the Third Legion's existence was the devastating loss of nearly the entirety of the gene stock of the Emperor's children. This disaster struck within a year of their monumentous triumph fighting along the Emperor on Proxima. As the Emperor's wars for unity would go on, they would suffer a myriad of gene seed flights, constantly decreasing their numbers and decreasing their combat effectiveness during the Great Crusade. With the pacification of the Selenar gene cults of Luna and the Treaty of Mars, the Imperium was now able to produce space marines at an unprecedented rate. Consequently, the legions began to expand rapidly to meet the demands of the vast new wars across the stars. During this period, 
the expansion of the gene seed forges on Luna undertook the implantation of recruits for all Space Marine legions. A portion of the third's gene seed reserve would be dispatched to Luna for this specific purpose. The events that followed, however, seem to be shrouded in no lesser amount of secrecy, as there are several conflicting accounts regarding the fate of these gene seed supplements. Some sources claim that the remnants of the subdued Celentine cults, still resistant to the Imperium's rule and the Imperial truth, hijacked a defense laser and destroyed the ship carrying a large majority of the Third Legion's precious cargo. Other accounts suggest the ship lost control and crashed while attempting to dock. Yet some stories assert that the vessel simply vanished without a trace, never to be found again. This tragedy, whichever version is true, was a major turning point for the Third Legion, as it profoundly impeded their ability to regenerate their ranks, leaving a long-lasting shadow over their early history as not only a logistical setback, but a blow to morale and the future of the Emperor's children, leading to the necessity of implantation techniques that would cause further flaws in the gene seed, leading to less and less Astartes being successfully made with each implantation attempt. However, it would not endanger the survival of the Legion as a whole, if not for a second calamity which occurred in quick succession. Like all Legions, the Third had created rituals to recover the progenoid gland from their fallen warriors. From these organs, a fresh set of gene seed implants could be grown, allowing for new Astartes to replace the fallen. This system, however, was far from perfect. The nature of battle and the manner upon which the legionaries died did not always allow for such recovery. To ensure a constant supply of organs for new aspirants, a reserve of gene seed of every legion was kept safe on Terra. This emergency reserve should have ensured the third legion's continued survival and growth regardless of what had happened on Luna, but within a single night that hope would be obliterated. It was discovered that a fast-acting viral blight had suddenly infected several gene seed vaults on Terra. Its cause unknown. Potentially, it could even be the nascent conflagrations of chaos. However, the janitors of the Mechanicum, tasked with overseeing gene seed stocks, would fight feverishly in order to contain all the blight that threatened to wipe out the entirety of the reserves on Terra in a mere few solar hours, erasing what had taken a near century to build. The infection was undoubtedly artificial due to its targeted infectivity, led many to suspect it was Xenos in origins. Any gene seed infected was rendered functionally useless. While many legions suffered losses from this biological attack, the blight seemed to destroy the entirety of the reserves of the Third Legion's gene seed stock. From that moment on, the Third Legion began to face an existential crisis. Their ability to regenerate their ranks was drastically and severely compromised, leaving them ever cloaked by the shadow of extinction looming just over them. This catastrophic event not only impacted their immediate future, but also left a lasting scar on their history, as they would question why had they been cursed so cruelly while other legions swelled in numbers unending, regardless of the setback, such as the Ninth Legion, who would constantly be set on missions which they were expected to become extinct, only to come back in greater numbers. It seems that while other legions grew in size and glory during the Great Crusade, gathering momentum, the Third Legion would only wither. The only means they had of replenishing their losses was through the use of their progenoid glands, harvest from their fallen. Without their Primarch to serve as a template for rapid replication, the Emperor and his gene rights of the Biotechnical Division could only rebuild the Third Legion's gene seed stocks at painstaking slow rates, meaning that they would likely be extinct if they were not careful within a fortnight of any conflict. As this laborious process unfolded, the Third Legion's strength and glory dwindled with each passing battle. It became evident that the Legion would fall far below effective strength, long before their gene seed stocks could be replenished. This was the doom of the Legion, and it seemed inevitable. Yet, just as hope seemed lost, the rediscovery of their Primarch, Fulgrim, transformed their fate, giving them a renewed hope. Known as a Phoenician, Fulgrim's return heralded a new era for the Emperor's children. This monumental event reinvigorated the Legion like no other, providing not only the genetic template they needed, but a charismatic leader to rally behind. 
to lift their spirits to further perfection. His presence alone inspired a resurgence, turning the tide of their fortunes. The once dwindling Third Legion would find new strength and purpose, their legacy forever altered by the return of their Primarch. After being taken from the Emperor of Mankind's gene laboratories beneath the Himalayan mountains of Terra, it seemed that Fulgrim's gestation capsule landed him on the mining world known as Chemos, and Chemos was a bleak and unforgiving planet, warmed by a small binary star cluster and perpetually shrouded in twilight by a thick nebula dust cloud. This desolate world had been settled by humanity during the Dark Age of Technology and had become isolated from its neighbors due to the great warp storms which marked the Age of Strife. However, even as they struggled for existence, Chemos' resources were dwindling greatly as its people struggled to produce enough food to meet their basic needs, only surviving due to a network of fortress factories undertaking the Herculean task of sustaining the entire planet's population. The inhabitants of Chemos would work incessantly and endlessly, maintaining the vapor mines and synthesizers, forsaking any form of recreation, art, and or leisure in order to ensure their survival. This was in large part due to the planet's dependence early on during the Dark Age of Technology on interstellar commerce for food in particular. As the warp storms made it exceedingly difficult for traders to reach Chemos, it seemed that Chemos would be doomed despite their strict food rationing and their efforts to improvise nutrient solutions, and due to this it seemed Chemos was faced with a slow and inevitable decline. Their relentless labor was just not enough to stave off the inevitable shortages and hardships that would be imposed by their isolated existence. However, this would all change with the arrival of Fulgrim on this disparate world, as he would eventually alter it creating a planet which had no shortage of art and grandeur. Such a task Fulgrim would undertake now to understand how he affected the Legion and how he would be affected by those in the greater galaxy, we must understand Fulgrim's time in Chemos. It all started when scouts from the fortress factory of Kallax planetary police force discovered the Primarch's gestation capsule after it had plummeted to the surface of Chemos. The infant within the capsule was so captivating that the scouts pleaded with the executive leaders of Kallax to spare the life. This was in large part due to how they ordinarily treated orphans, as they were quickly put to death in order to avoid further straining the settlement's resources. However, Fulgrim was spared and entrusted to one of these rescuers, and said individual was a member of the caretakers, who would raise him as his own child, and the name Fulgrim would come from an ancient deity of the Chemosian people. Fulgrim soon became a legend in his own right. At half the age when most children began to work in the vapor mines and the synthesizers, Fulgrim would already meet the obligations of an adult laborer. His understanding of Chemosian mining technology was in essence intuitive, allowing him to modify and enhance its efficiency due to an extraordinary inbuilt technical acumen. By the age of 15 Terran years, Fulgrim had ascended from a simple laborer to becoming one of the executives who governed the fortress factory of Kallax. As a leader, Fulgrim grasped the dire plight facing Kallax and other settlements on Chemos. The population and their technology were in a gradual state of decline due to the severe resource shortages they faced. Fulgrim's rise to leadership and his subsequent contributions would mark the beginning of a transformation upon Chemos, and ultimately a transformation for the Third Legion itself once they reconnected with their father. Under Fulgrim's visionary leadership, teams of engineers embarked on ambitious expeditions beyond Kallax and beyond the other fortress factories. Without him, this would be a death nail to all those who exited, but thanks to him and his great leadership, they reclaimed and restored many of Chemos's ancient mining outposts, some of which had produced supplies for the first time in more than solar decades. This allowed for the creation of a surplus, something which had not been known long since prior, and this surplus allowed Chemos to purchase food and other essential materials from what appeared to be interstellar traders, which allowed the planet to finally be lifted from its prolonged state of scarcity. Recognized as a planetary leader, Fulgrim also championed the revival of Chemosian art and culture, seeing it as a vital element of human life that had been long forsaken due to the 
planet's relentless research shortages and grueling labor demands. This cultural renaissance was a rather significant turning point for Chemos, as it began to thrive under Fulgrim's guidance. Here would begin the tradition of Fulgrim marrying mortal women, but due to his exceedingly long lifespan, he would suffer as he saw them slowly fade away due to the imperfections of humanity, leading him to further try to perfect all aspects of humanity to an obsessive degree. At first it would be remarked that he did in fact love some of them, but as time would go on he would become numbed to their presences, the constant deaths, the constant loss. To many, this marked Fulgrim as indeed eternally bound by suffering derived from human imperfection. Not long after the monumental achievement of Chemos's renaissance, its isolation would come to an abrupt end, as descending from the perpetually twilight sky, a formation of Stormbird dropships would appear, their heavily armored battle-scarred hulls emblazoned with the Palatine Aquila, the personal insignia of the Emperor of Mankind, and the insignia of the Emperor's children. This sight of the Aquila seemed to stir long-buried memories within Fulgrim Though Chemos lacked a former military, the caretakers had formed a planetary police of sorts. A force which would function dual roles as police and protectors of the fortress cities from any and all raiders. It seemed that these men had seen the Stormbirds landing as a potential threat so they quickly surrounded them and prepared to fire upon them. However, Fulgrim would quickly command the caretakers to welcome their visitors and escort them to Kallax for an audience with him. In his private quarters, Fulgrim encountered what appeared to be heavily armored warriors from the stars. These were the Astartes, and they represented a true civilization which embodied the culture and refinement that he aspired to restore in Chemos. Emerging from their ranks was a resplendent figure, the radiant Emperor of Mankind. Upon seeing the Emperor, Fulgrim was overwhelmed by recognition and reverence, as he silently knelt before his father and offered his sword in his service. From that moment on, Fulgrim would vow to dedicate himself entirely to the Emperor of Mankind and his Imperium. From here, the Emperor would enlighten his son about Terra and the Great Crusade, and the grand army that he would lead. His endeavor was one that resonated deeply within Fulgrim, as the Emperor told him that he desired to reunite the fragmented world worlds of humanity under a single rule, and that it was this unity which was crucial to prevent humanity's potential extinction at the hands of the galaxy's numerous threats, and to establish humanity as the preeminent intelligent species within the Milky Way. Seeing the state of the planet that he had originally landed on, Fulgrim's beliefs and ideologies greatly resonated with this. While Imperial records do not specify an exact date for this pivotal meeting, they do note that Fulgrim flagship, the Pride of the Emperor, was completed by the Mechanicum of Mars 160 years before the onset of the Horus Heresy in the early 31st millennium. It would be then that Fulgrim would return to Terra with the Emperor in order to meet with the Third Legion, those sons crafted from his own genome. To his horror he learned that a series of calamities had nearly annihilated the entirety of the Legion, leaving the majority of their gene siege stock cultivated from his DNA in rather severe straits. The combination of the initial accident, the subsequent viral blight, and the Emperor's children's dogmatic following of the Emperor's orders had greatly cost the Legion. Without the access to their Primarch, replenishing their gene siege stocks had been an arduous and slow process. However, before Fulgrim on Terra stood 200 transhuman warriors which represented the entirety of the Third Legion's remaining strength. These Astartes bore banners of companies which had now been reduced to mere handfuls or entirely perished. Despite the reduced numbers, they stood unbowed, unbroken, and proud embodying a defiance of fate that perhaps mirrored Fulgrim's own struggles on Chemos. In a solemn address, Fulgrim entrusted them with a sacred mission to bring the Emperor's wisdom to the stars, stating, You are the Emperor's chosen, his heralds, his warriors, his children, for this is only the beginning. The Emperor would then be so moved by Fulgrim's words and the steadfastness of the Legion that he formally declared that the Emperor's children would be the designation 
nation known for this legion, which no other could show any form of reprisal to. From here, the Officio Militaris Colleges of Arms recorded a monumental change, as the Third Legion's colors would be changed to Imperial Purple and an Eagle's Town Spur would be their emblem, along with the Imperial Aquila. They would be granted a unique right, serving at the Emperor's behest alongside their Primarch. Fulgrim was soon consumed by the imperative that he and the Emperor's children had to live up to the extraordinary honors bestowed upon them by the Emperor, as they aimed to become shining paragons of perfection who were meant to inherit and embody the Emperor's personhood and his vision for imperial culture and civilization as a whole. This drive for perfection permeated every singular aspect of the Primarch and his legion from then on, from their military tactics to their embrace of an unusually artistic legion culture, one which could only really be matched by that of the later Blood Angels and the Salamanders in varying ways. But while the others' artistic talents would come from necessity and or an inherent trait, the Emperor's children would strive for this artistic perfection not due to any traits or inherent desires or even love for the art, but rather for the need to be perfect in every way, including said art. This was to the point that they would develop an concern for aesthetics and personal appearances which was unparalleled amongst the Astartes, even at points rivaling the vanity of later imperial nobility. Fulgrim himself would epitomize the pursuit for physical beauty. His long silver hair flowed down his back, his wide eyes and melodic voice would welcome all those who sought his counsel, and his full lips often curved in a wary, inviting smile. His power armor was that of the finest quality fabricated by imperial technology, and it would be intrinsically decorated in the purple and gold colors he had chosen for his legion. Over this he would often wear a variety of intricately embroidered high-collared cloaks. However, something that would gnaw at him from his horror would be that while he he was practiced and poised physical perfection, one of his brothers would rival his aesthetic perfection almost naturally. This would be the great angel himself, Sanguinius, and while he was often considered one of the most charismatic primarchs, he would seem to never be able to, to outdo Horus Lupicol in this field. This led to the Emperor's children being a unique blend of warrior artists. This was largely driven by their primarch's vision for the embodiment of the pinnacle of humanity. They would be exemplars amongst exemplars, the greatest of the great. Fulgrim was eager to begin his conquests of the unknown regions of the galaxy as part of the Great Crusade. However, he would quickly realize that his 200 warriors were far too few to undertake such ambitious endeavors alone. Recognizing the necessity of nurturing the Emperor's children's recovery, the Emperor asked the Primarch Horus Lupicol to mentor his brother Fulgrim and his legion. Over a solar decade, the Emperor's children and the Luna Wolves would fight side by side, forming a bond of brotherhood forged in trust and tempered by battle. Despite their differences, Horus and, Fulgr Horus and Fulgrim created an unbreakable bond. The two legions grew incredibly close as they complemented each other in many ways. While Horus was swift and intuitive, Fulgrim was patient and considered. While the Luna Wolves were direct and brutal, the Emperor's children were flexible and subtle. When the Emperor's children eventually stood on their own, they had become oath brothers with the Luna Wolves, a bond that treachery would one day twist into a chain which would shackle their souls eternally. Over the course of several decades, the Empress children's ranks swelled with new Astartes recruited from both Terra and Chemos. This was where the Legion had established its fortress monastery, in particular in the old factory fortress of Kallax, and due to this they had grown at a significant rate, marking an expansion amongst the ranks, allowing them to fully participate in the Emperor's vision for the Great Crusade. Through their shared experiences and with the guiding hand of Horus, the Emperor's children evolved from a formidable force embodying 
the ideals of perfection and excellence to one which actively was the ideal of perfection and excellence that Fulgrim so passionately pursued. When the Empress' children reached an appropriate size, Fulgrim would assume command of the 28th Expeditionary Fleet of the Great Crusade, embarking on a campaign that reclaimed numerous human settled worlds for the Imperium, and amongst these conquests they would unfortunately run into an advanced Xenos world where Fulgrim's destiny would take a fatal turn. Here we must deviate from the timeline to note the importance of the bond between Primarch's Fulgrim, known as a Phoenician, and his brother Ferris Manus, known as the Gorgon. This was a connection that was profound and renowned throughout the Imperium during the Great Crusade, only really rivaled by the connection between Horus and Sanguinius. Their profound connection was forged during their first meeting beneath Mount Nordia on Terra, in particular in the principal forges of Ulrus. Here, Ferris Manus, Primarch of the Iron Hands, had been demonstrating his extraordinary skills alongside the Forge Masters who had once served the Terawatt clan during the Unification Wars. Upon Fulgrim's arrival, and as he and his elite Phoenix Guard descended upon the Forge complex, a palpable tension seemed to fill the air. Despite never having met, both Primarchs immediately recognized the shared bond of gene alchemy and science that had defined their creation. They would become brothers almost closer than any others. True kin. And it seemed that their presence together was so imposing that the artisans surrounding them were gripped by fear that would come from the potential conflict that could arise between the demigods, as they would follow to prostrate themselves in order to gain some modicum of safety. Reflecting on this encounter, Ferris Manus recounted to Astartes of the 10th Legion that Fulgrim had declared his intent to forge the most perfect weapon that had ever been created, one that he would wield in the forthcoming Great Crusade. This declaration marked a pivotal moment in the unfolding saga of not just the Emperor's children and their Primarch, but of the Iron Hands Legion and the Imperium as a whole. The rivalry between Fulgrim and Ferris Manus would be a rather great one, but not one of enmity, rather one of mutual respect and friendly competition. Where Fulgrim boasted of forging the most perfect weapon ever created, Ferris Manus, famed for his living metal hands, Jovially scoffed at the idea of anything crafted by Fulgrim's pasty hands rivaling any of his creations. Undeterred by the jest, Fulgrim accepted this challenge with both dignity and grace as the two Primarchs stripped to their waists and embarked on a marathon of craftsmanship within the echoing confines of the Mountain Forge. For three intense solar months, the forges resounded with the relentless clanging of hammers and the hiss of cooling metal. All the while, the brothers would banter as the two demigods vied to outdo each other in every regard. At the culmination of their labor, each presented their masterpiece. Fulgrim presented the unrivaled Forge Breaker, an exquisite warhammer capable of cleaving mountains in a single blow. Meanwhile, Ferris Manus revealed the Fireblade, a, a golden-bladed sword which was perpetually aflame with the Forge's essence. Both weapons surpassed any other previously wrought by human hands, and in a rare moment of humanity, each Primarch declared the other's creation superior. Fulgrim likened the Fireblade to the legendary sword of Nuada Silverhand, while Ferris proclaimed Forgebreaker worthy of the Thunder God of Nordic lore. Without hesitation, each exchanged weapons, cementing their eternal bond of friendship through their shared craftsmanship. And indeed, Forgebreaker was a marvel to behold. Its weight would be unmanageable, save for the Emperor's Astartes, but to a Primarch, it would be swung like a mere toy, weightless even. Its ebony haft was adorned with threads of gold and silver, forming a beautiful and intricately crafted lightning bolt. As the hammer's head culminated in the shape of a majestic eagle, its beak poised to strike and its wings outstretched in formidable glory. Those who gaze upon it sensed its profound excellence and the very Primarch-like essence infused within the weapon. It was truly a testament, not just of skill, but of love, honor, and loyalty, which should have ensured the bond between the two brothers. 